Hello, children and Nagarn. Today we're going to be solving May June 2022 Paper 1 Variant 2. And before we start, we are offering free Topic 1 notes. All you have to do is fill in the form in the description box down below. We are also selling Topic 2 notes, which include all the tips, tricks of Paper 1, and common misconceptions with worked examples too. Upon purchase, you can ask us unlimited number of questions about the topic or pass paper questions for free, and you're able to exclusively contact us at any time, which is a new and unique service. We also have another monthly service, which you can ask us unlimited number of questions and past paper questions. For the full AS biology syllabus, only for $15 per month. Question number one, the photomicrograph shows a bronchiole and alveoli. The magnification of the image is 360. What is the maximum diameter of the bronchial lumen? So first of all, you must identify the bronchiole. So this is the bronchiole. And what's surrounding it is the alveoli. Now, here's asking for the maximum diameter of the bronchiole. This means the actual size of the bronchiole. And we all know the equation for magnification is going to be image size divided by actual size or IM. And here it's asking us for the actual size. Therefore, what we must do is we measure the image size using a ruler and we've done this prior and the image size is 50 millimeters. Because here all the answers are in micrometers, we must convert it to micrometers by multiplying by 1000. So 50 times by 1000 is going to give you 50,000. Therefore, image size, which is 50,000 divided by 360, is going to give us 138.8, which rounds up to 140 micrometers, and the answer is going to be C. Question number two, a specimen is observed twice with a microscope. Firstly, using green light with a wavelength of 510 nanometers, which has a shorter wavelength, then using red light with a wavelength of 650 nanometers with a larger wavelength. What happens to the magnification and resolution when using red light compared with green light? Now, as we increase or decrease the wavelength, the, the magnification is not altered. It always stays the same if we alter the wavelength. Now, the resolution is the only thing that's actually changed. Now, if we used red light, this means that the wavelength actually increased. If the wavelength increased, here we have a general rule is that the limit of resolution is half the wavelength used to view the specimen. Therefore, the limit of resolution for the red light is going to be 325 nanometers for the red light and for the green light is going to be 255 nanometers for green. Now here, as the wavelength decreases or the number decreases, the resolution increases. Therefore, green light has a higher resolution. And resolution, by the way, is the ability to distinguish between two separate points. So green light, because it has a shorter wavelength, it has a higher resolution. So lower number means a higher resolution. Therefore, what happens when we're using the red light? The resolution therefore decreases. And the answer is going to be C. Question number three, four students were asked to match the function with the appearance of some cell structures in an animal cell. The functions were listed by number and the appearances were listed by letter. Which student correctly matched the numbered functions with the appearance of the cell structure? Now, let's start with one. One, produces the mitotic spindle during cell division. As we all know, what produces the mitotic spindle during prophase is going to be the centrioles made of microtubules. Therefore, here we have a choice between W or Y. Let's see W, non-membrane bound spherical structures. Now, non-membrane bound spherical structures are going to be ribosomes because they are not surrounded by a membrane. Now, let's see why non-membrane bound cylindrical structures. Now, cylindrical structures are microtubules Therefore, one is going to be Y. Now let's see two, synthesis of polypeptides. As we all know, polypeptides are synthesized on ribosomes on top of rough endoplasmic reticulum. Now let's see the suggestions that we have here. We have W, 
non-membrane bound spherical structures. These are ribosomes, therefore W is correct. And for Z, here we have membrane bound stacks arranged as a flattened stack. So flattened stacks are Golgi body because they are arranged almost as coins, stacks on top of each other. So this is not correct. And for two, the correct answer is going to be W. Now for three, synthesis of lipids. As we all know, what synthesizes lipids is going to be the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. It synthesizes lipids and steroids. Therefore, here we have a choice between V and W. So V membranes which surround an enclosed inner cavity. So an enclosed inner cavity means an almost tubular structure. And that tubular structure is the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So V is correct. Let's see W. And non-membrane bound spherical structures, we just said is going to be ribosomes. Therefore, the correct answer is going to be C. Question number four, what is found in chloroplasts and mitochondria? A, 70S ribosomes only. So it's not 70S ribosomes only. Let's see the rest of the suggestions that we have here. B, 70S ribosomes and circular DNA. This is correct. There are both 70S and circular DNA for protein synthesis and DNA to code for these proteins. See, ATS ribosomes in circular DNA. So as we all know, ATS ribosomes are only found in the cytoplasm of eukaryotic cells. They are not actually found inside chloroplasts and mitochondria. Therefore, this is incorrect. The circular DNA only. It's also not circular DNA only. So the correct answer is going to be B. Number five, which feature is known for all known viruses? A, capsid made of lipid and protein. Now, capsid for all viruses are made of protein, definitely. But not all viruses have capsids made of both lipid and protein. So lipid here is the incorrect part. B. DNA core. As we all know, some viruses have a DNA core and some viruses have an RNA core. So such as retroviruses, for example. So we cannot guarantee it's always going to be the DNA. So this is incorrect. C. Outer envelope of phospholipid. Now, as we all know, the envelopes are typically derived from portions of the host cell membranes. So, the material that the envelope is made of, of the virus, is derived or depends on the material or the cell membrane of the host cell. So, it varies from host cell to another. Therefore, this is incorrect for the non-cellular structure. This is correct because viruses are actually not cells. Therefore, the correct answer is going to be D. Four extracts from different plant materials were made and tested with Benedict's solution. The extracts were boiled with Benedict's solution for 240 seconds and the final color was recorded. Now, Benedict's solution is the test for reducing sugars and a positive test would be from blue to brick red. And we use Roy G. Biv in reverse in order to know the concentrations and the color changes of the Benedict solution. So blue being no concentration of reducing sugars and as we go to red, the concentration of reducing sugar increases. So this is the order of color changes that take place. Now, which sequence of plant extracts represents an increase in quantity of reducing sugar? Now, as we all know, here it says an increase in quantity, this means from smallest to largest quantity. Now, the smallest quantity of reducing sugar is definitely going to be blue. So, we're starting with three. Now, as I told you here previously, we use Roy G. Biv in reverse. Then, the second smallest concentration of reducing sugar is going to be green color. Therefore, four comes after it. Then, it changes color from yellow. Therefore, two comes after it and then red with the highest reducing sugar concentration. Therefore, the answer is going to be D. Question number seven, which have properties that are dependent on hydrogen bonds? One, cellulose. Of course, cellulose has hydrophilic properties, which allows adhesion of water molecules between cellulose and water molecules. And this is a way of water transport in plants of the xylem. Therefore, this is correct and it depends on hydrogen bonds because we just said adhesion. For two, a molecule of hemoglobin. As we all know, hemoglobin is a globular protein. This means that it has the hydrophilic 
R groups to the outside, and the hydrophilic R groups are able to form hydrogen bonds with the extracellular fluid, and the hydrophobic amino acids are to the center. Therefore, this makes the molecule of a hemoglobin soluble, and it's soluble because the hydrophilic amino acids towards the outside are able to form hydrogen bonds with water. Therefore, hemoglobin is correct. 3. Water, of course. Properties of water is that it could form hydrogen bonds with each other. Therefore, this is correct, and the answer is going to be A. Number 8. Which statement is correct? A. Cellulose, glycogen, and amylopectin are all polymers. This is correct. Cellulose is a polymer made of beta-glucose units, and glycogen is a polymer also made of alpha-glucose units, and amylopectin is also made of alpha-glucose, so this is correct. B. Ribose, amylase, and phospholipid are all macromolecules. So macromolecules are giant molecules made up of one, over 1,000 molecules. And as we all know here, we see ribose. Ribose is a pentose sugar component found in RNA nucleotides. And a pentose sugar, as we all know, it has five carbon atoms. Therefore, it could never be a macromolecule. Therefore, this is incorrect. C. Starch, glucose, and amylose are all monomers. Now, amylose is not a monomer, it's actually a polymer. D. Sucrose, deoxyribose, and amylopectin are all polysaccharides. Now, sucrose is not a polysaccharide, it's a disaccharide, therefore it's incorrect, and the correct answer is going to be A. Question number 9. The diagram shows two amino acids. Some of the hydrogen atoms are numbered 1 to 6. Which two numbered hydrogen atoms could contribute to the production of molecule of water when a peptide bond forms between these two amino acids? So, as you all know, when a peptide bond is formed, a molecule of water is also formed, and a peptide bond is formed between the hydroxyl group of the carboxyl part and the one hydrogen atom of the nitrile part. Therefore, it could form between 4 and 3, or 1 and 6, for example. This is, this is also a hydrogen, and this is a, a hydroxyl part of the carboxylic acid group. Therefore, the correct answer is going to be B. Question number 10. A student wrote four statements about water. Which statements are correct? 1. Water has a high specific heat capacity, which maintains the temperature of water within cells. Of course, this is correct. A specific heat capacity is the energy required to increase the temperature of 1 kilogram of water by 1 degree. And if the water has a high specific heat capacity, this means it has to absorb large amounts of energy in order to change temperature. Therefore, it needs a really high quantity of energy to increase temperature. Therefore, this enables it to form a constant body temperature. Therefore, this is correct. Two mammals rely on water having a relatively low latent heat of vaporization to keep them cool. Now, here this is incorrect because it has actually a high latent heat of vaporization to keep them cool. Because when mammals sweat, the sweat on their skin has to absorb a large amounts of water to be able to change state because latent heat of vaporization is the energy required for water to change state. Therefore, this means that so much energy needs to be absorbed from the body into the water droplets or sweat droplets on the skin of the mammals. Therefore, this helps keep them cool because it removes energy from the body. Therefore. Low is incorrect and high is correct, and this is incorrect. Three. When a negatively charged ion is added to water, the partially positive charge on hydrogen atom is attracted to the ion. Now, why are certain substances, such as the substances with partial positive or negative charges, attracted to water in the first place? This is because that water is a polar molecule. Because if we draw a water molecule out, we're going to see that the hydrogen here has a partially positive charge and oxygen has a partially negative charge. Therefore, if we replace a negatively charged ion, it will be attracted to the hydrogen. Therefore, this is correct. For when surrounded by water, non-polar molecules tend to be pushed apart from one another. Now, the, uh, 
pushed apart is going to be incorrect. The reason for this is, let's see lipids as an example. When hydrophobic molecules are placed in water, actually water molecules push them close together or push them together in order to form something as lipid droplets. Now I'm using here lipids as an example, of course. Therefore, they actually tend to push them together and this is when we see the lipid droplets. Therefore, pushed apart is incorrect and the answer therefore is going to be B. Question number 11. Typical enzymes are large globular proteins with a specific tertiary shape. Which molecular interactions are directly involved in maintaining the tertiary shape? Now, as we all know, tertiary shape is the further coiling and folding of a single polypeptide chain by forming bonds between the R groups or the side chains. Now, we must first know the types of bonds formed between the R chains or the side chains of the amino acids. Therefore, as we all know, tertiary has hydrogen bonding disulfide, hydrophobic, and hydrophilic. Therefore, all three of these are correct and the answer is going to be A. Question number 12. Which statement about Michael's Menten constant Km is correct for an enzyme with a low affinity for its substrate? So an enzyme with a low affinity for its substrate means that it has a higher Michael's Menten constant or Km value because they are inversely proportional. If the affinity decreases, then the Michael's Menten constant increases. Now let's see the suggestions that we have here. A. It has a high Km and reaches Vmax at a high substrate concentration. Now, this is actually correct because as we said here, if the enzyme has a low affinity for its substrate, this means that it requires larger amounts of substrate in order to bring the reaction to its Vmax value. Therefore, this is correct. For B, it has a higher Km and reaches Vmax at a low substrate concentration. This is incorrect. This would be correct if it had a lower Km value or a higher affinity. Therefore, the correct answer must be A. Question number 13. Long chain saturated fatty acids change from solid to liquid at higher temperatures compared with short chain unsaturated fatty acids. Which fatty acids would be more likely to form triglycerides in mammals that live in cold climates? Now, as we all know, cold climates means that the cell surface membrane is going to be less fluid. Now here we are looking for factors that would increase the fluidity of the membrane because in, if in cold climates the membrane remained less fluid then this would be danger on the organism so here we're looking for the fatty acids properties that would increase the fluidity therefore as we all know that long chain actually decrease the fluidity because as the chain increases this means that there are going to be more bond interactions. More bond interactions means that the fatty acids would be even held closer together, meaning that it would become less fluid. So therefore, long is incorrect and shorter is correct because if it's shorter, then this means that there are going to be less bond interactions in the membrane. Therefore, short is correct. Now. As we all know, we're looking for the properties that make the cell membrane more fluid. Now here we have saturated and unsaturated. We all know in unsaturated fatty acids, there are kinks in the membrane. These kinks actually increase the distance between the fatty acids. And increasing the distance means that the membrane becomes more fluid compared with the saturated, which they bind very close together, making the membrane less fluid. Therefore, unsaturated in this case is going to be correct and the answer is going to be D. 14. When animal cells are cultured, salt solution is added to keep the cells alive. What is the purpose of the salt solution? A. To allow facilitated diffusion of salts into the cells. Now, this is incorrect. It has nothing to do with facilitated diffusion. Actually, adding salt, we all know that inside the cell, there is some sort of a solute concentration. Now, what we are doing is we're adding also solute or salt to the extracellular fluid in order to maintain the osmotic balance. 
because if we just added the cell into normal water with a higher water potential on the outside and a lower water potential to the inside, then water might enter inside the cell by osmosis and the cell might actually burst because it's an animal cell, so it will burst. Therefore, we're trying to maintain the osmotic balance. Now let's see B. To prevent diffusion of other ions in or out of cells, we said this is incorrect, it's to do with osmosis and water. C. To prevent the net movement of water into or out of cells, this is correct, and the answer is going to be C. Following our old processes that allow movement into cells, which processes require ATP? So one, phagocytosis. As we all know, phagocytosis is a form of endocytosis. And as we all know, in endocytosis, the movement of vesicles actually requires ATP and energy. Therefore, this is correct for two. Active transport, as we all know, pumping substances against concentration gradients definitely do require ATP, so this is correct. Three, facilitated diffusion. It's a passive process that does not require ATP. When substances diffuse through the cells, through transport proteins. Therefore, the correct answer is going to be A. Question number 16, which features are required to allow for efficient diffusion? One, a large surface area. So as we all know, increasing the surface area is one of the factors that actually increase the rate of diffusion. Therefore, it allows for efficient diffusion. Therefore, this is correct to a short diffusion pathway. So a shorter diffusion pathway, if the molecules have to travel for less distance, this means that your rate of diffusion would also increase. Therefore, it will allow efficient diffusion. Therefore, this is correct. Three, maintenance of a constant diffusion gradient. Now, this is the trick part here. As the question is asking for efficient diffusion. So, for example, if we keep always altering the diffusion gradient, therefore, diffusion will not be efficient. If we suddenly keep increasing the diffusion gradient in one moment, then decreasing it, it's not constant, therefore diffusion will not be efficient. Therefore, this is correct, and the answer is going to be A. Number 17, what is a role of mitosis? A growth of organisms. This is correct. If cells keep dividing, then the role of mitosis is growth because cell numbers keeps increasing. Now B, production of genetically different cells. So different is incorrect. It's supposed to be genetically identical cells. C, repair of cells. Now cells itself are not repaired actually. It's tissues that are repaired. Therefore, this is incorrect. The replacement of cancerous tissue. So there's no such thing as replacement of cancerous tissue. Actually, cancerous tissue keeps growing and it is not replaced. And mitosis is the reason that cancerous tissue keeps increasing and increasing. It is not replaced. Therefore, the correct answer is going to be A. Question number 18. Telomeres prevent the loss of genes from the ends of chromosomes during DNA replication, but they become shorter each time they are copied. In cancer cells and stem cells, the telomeres remain the same length, which statement is correct for all human cells. Now let's first define what are telomeres. So telomeres are length of non-coding DNA found at the ends of chromatids. So each chromosome made of two chromatids has four telomeres. Now. Let's see the suggestions that we have here. A. If telomeres become too short, a cell may stop dividing. This is correct because if telomeres become too short, this means that the material or, or the length of non-coding DNA that was protecting the DNA from DNA loss is now not available. Therefore, DNA damage would occur at the ends and a cell may stop dividing because now it has DNA damage or lost its DNA. For B, adding telomeres could increase the rate of aging of cells. No, actually adding telomeres decrease the rate of aging. Because as we all know, as telomeres concentration increase, this means that the cell lives for longer and is able to also divide more. C, telomeres are repaired by the enzyme RNA polymerase. No, they are repaired by the enzyme telomerase. Therefore, this is incorrect. D. Telomeres prevent all damage occurring to DNA molecules. It does not prevent all damage. It only prevents gene shortening during DNA replication only. But it does not prevent damage occurring to DNA molecules because of mutations or toxic substances, for example. 
Therefore, this is not always correct and therefore the answer is going to be A. Question number 19. The nucleus of a mouse body in cell G1 phase of the cell cycle has 1.2 times by 10 to the power of negative 12 grams of DNA. What will be the mass of DNA in the nucleus of the cell at the end of the S phase and at the end of G2 phase of the cell cycle? Now, as we all know, the DNA replicates during the S phase. And here it's showing us the nucleus of a mouse or the number of grams of DNA during G1 phase. As we all know, the order is G1, S phase, then G2. Therefore, if the DNA replicates at the S phase, then the DNA that was during the G1 phase is going to double. Therefore, the DNA doubles at the S phase and also at the G2 phase because it comes right after the S phase. Therefore, the DNA is in both doubled and the answer is going to be D. Number 20. What occurs during prophase in animal cells? 1. Fragmentation of nuclear envelope. Of course, this is correct because in late prophase, the nuclear envelope breaks down into small vesicles, also known as fragments, which cannot be seen using an electron microscope even. And 2. Nucleolus disappears. Yes, this also happens in late prophase, the nucleolus disappears. 3. Stained chromosomes become visible. Yes, in this case, the chromosomes become visible and they become condensed. Contrasting telophase and interphase, for example. 4. Centrioles replicate. Now, centrioles replicate into the S phase. No replication happens during prophase. It replicates at the S phase. And also the DNA also replicates by semi-conservative DNA replication during S phase. Therefore, this is incorrect. All centrioles actually move at the opposite poles of these cells, but they do not replicate. Therefore, the answer is going to be B. 21. Which statement describes the structure of ATP? So ATP, let's draw it down. It has a ribose sugar. and has an adenine nitrogenous base and has three phosphate groups and both the ribose and adenine are known as adenosine now let's see the suggestions that we have here a it is a dna nucleotide with two extra phosphates now let's first start with dna nucleotide now as we all know that ATP has a ribose sugar, not a deoxyribose. A DNA nucleotide actually has a deoxyribose sugar. Therefore, DNA is going to be incorrect. Now, let's see, see, it has an RNA nucleotide. This is correct because RNA nucleotides do have ribose sugars. So RNA is going to be correct with two extra phosphates. Now, as we all know that a nucleotide already has one phosphate so if we assume that this was an RNA nucleotide it has already one phosphate then it says with two extra phosphates so this is correct because the nucleotide already has a phosphate and what we're doing to turn it to ATP is we're just adding two extra phosphates so this is correct and please don't be confused between three extra phosphates because one was already present from the RNA nucleotide. Therefore three is incorrect because now we would actually have four phosphates if that was the case. Therefore the correct answer is going to be C. Rifampicin is an antibiotic used to treat tuberculosis. It works by inhibiting RNA polymerase in bacteria, which processes are directly inhibited by this antibiotic. So RNA polymerase, as we all know, it actually forms mRNA molecules used for protein synthesis now let's look at the suggestions that we have here one dna replication now this is incorrect all it would only have been correct if it was dna polymerase which was inhibited not the rna so this is incorrect to enzyme synthesis as we all know rna polymerases catalyzes the formation of mrna molecule which is translated to the ribosome and forms a polypeptide which then forms an enzyme.
because the enzymes are proteins. Therefore, protein synthesis is going to be altered, so this is correct. 3. ATP synthesis. This would only have been correct if we were talking about a eukaryotic cell where ATP synthesis happens inside the mitochondria. Because as we said, that the mitochondria also has a circular DNA of its own and also have 70S ribosomes where proteins are also synthesized inside mitochondria. But in the case of bacteria, they do not have mitochondria with its own 70S ribosomes and circular DNA. Therefore, inhibiting RNA polymerase inside the mitochondria of a eukaryotic cell would actually have an impact on ATP synthesis. But in case that we're talking about bacteria, which ATP synthesis happens inside the cytoplasm, it has nothing to do with RNA polymerase. Therefore, this is going to be incorrect. Question number 23, the diagram shows the DNA triplet codes for some amino acids. The base sequences on the template DNA strand coding for part of a polypeptide is shown. Two mutations occur in the sequence during DNA replication. Which mutated template DNA strand would result in a shorter polypeptide? Now, the only mutation or the scenario of mutation that would result in a shorter polypeptide or terminate translation is during a nonsense mutation. A nonsense mutation is a mutation where a DNA triplet code is actually replaced by DNA stop codon. This definitely terminates translation and results in a shorter polypeptide. Now, here we're looking for the suggestions that shows that a stop codon has been suddenly inserted. Now, what we can see here is ATC is the stop codon, so we're looking for ATC. So ATC is only present in C. Therefore, it will terminate translation up to four DNA triplet codes. Therefore, this is correct and the answer is going to be C. Question number 24. Some of the features present in transport tissues are listed. Which features are present in xylem vessel elements? So let's start with one, lignified walls. Yes, definitely lignified walls are present in the xylem to give it a structural support and aids in the transportation of water and mineral ions. To cytoplasm, as we all know, xylem vessels are dead cells or hollow cells. Therefore, they never have cytoplasm, so this is incorrect. Three, mitochondria. As we said, that xylem is a non-living cell. It does not have mitochondria. Four, pits. Yes, it does have pits to allow lateral air movement outside the xylem because air bubbles inside the xylem could actually disrupt the cohesion pattern of water and disrupt the transport of water inside the xylem vessel elements. Therefore, this is correct for five. Plasmodismata. Now, as we all know, another definition of plasmodismata is actually strands of cytoplasm projecting from cell membranes. So strands of cytoplasm and as we said earlier that xylem vessel elements are actually dead cells or non-living cells therefore they never have cytoplasm therefore plasmodesmata is incorrect and the answer is going to be one and four which is C. Question number 25 the diagram shows transverse sections through parts of plants which row is correct? Now let's first start by labeling the parts. Now this is a cross section through a leaf and as we all know, on a leaf, the xylem vessel elements are always going to be up and the phloem is going to be at the bottom. Now, this is a cross section through a stem and as we all know, the phloem is going to be towards the outside and the xylem is towards the inside. Now, this is a cross section through a root and five is going to be the phloem. And what looks like a cross sign is going to be the xylem. Now, let's see the suggestion. So, contains lignin. As we all know, that xylem is what contains the lignin because lignin is a, is a supporting material for cell walls in the xylem, which helps maintain the xylem vessel elements and supports it. So, 1, 4, and 6 is going to be correct. Now, here transports organic solutes. So organic solutes such as sucrose, for example, is always transported by the phloem. Therefore, 
two, three, and five is going to be correct for the phloem, and the answer is going to be B. Question number 26, which molecules form hydrogen bonds with water during transpiration? Now, let's see the suggestions that we have here. One, cellulose in xylem wall. Now, cellulose has hydrophilic properties. And one mechanism of water transport of the xylem is adhesion. And adhesion is when water molecules form hydrogen bonds with the hydrophilic cellulose in the xylem vessel wall. So this is correct to subrin in xylem wall. This is incorrect because we know that subrin is a waterproof material found in the Casparian strip. Therefore, because it's waterproof, it can't actually form hydrogen bonds with water whatsoever. Therefore, this is incorrect. Let's see three other water molecules in the xylem. So this is here known as cohesion. So the first was adhesion and now we're talking about cohesion. Cohesion is when water molecules form hydrogen bonds with each other to go up the xylem in a continuous water molecule column. Therefore, three is going to be correct, one and three, and the answer is going to be C. Question number 27, some plant species can take up heavy metal contaminants that are dissolved in soil water and then transport them within the plant. Within the plant cells, the heavy metals accumulate mainly in the vacuole. Which suggestions about the transport and accumulation of heavy metals are valid? One, after initial entry into the root, some of the heavy metals can pass through to the tonoplast to be stored in the vacuole of cells in the cortex. Now, as we said, it accumulates mainly in the vacuole. Therefore, it could pass through to the tonoplast and it's the membrane surrounding the vacuole to be stored in the vacuole. So this is correct. Two, the heavy metals take an apoplastic pathway in the xylem, but at the endodermis must take a symplast pathway. Now, this is correct. The heavy metals take an apoplast pathway in the xylem or, or the symplast, but at the endodermis, it has to take a symplast pathway. Why, you would ask, is because at the endodermis, there is a Casparian strip on endodermal cells, and the Casparian strip contains the waterproof material called subrin. And subrin is a waterproof material that does not let water through and forces substances to go through by the symplast pathway or the cell root. So it must actually enter inside the cell. Therefore, this is correct. Three, the rate of accumulation of heavy metals in leaf cells will be faster at night when photosynthesis is not occurring than during the day. Now here it says the heavy metals are actually dissolved in soil water and we all know that soil water and mineral ions are transported by the xylem, the vessel elements. Therefore transpiration is involved. As we all know that during the day there is going to be a faster movement of water in the xylem because photosynthesis requires water to be available. And also during the day transpiration rates increases. Therefore, this means that more water is going to be pulled up the xylem, then more heavy metal contaminants are also going to be pulled up the xylem. Therefore, it will not actually be faster at night, it will be faster during the day due to an increased rate of transpiration. The presence of heavy metals causes the transpiration stream to slow down and reduce the rate of transpiration. No, heavy metals is not one of the factors that actually alter the rate of transpiration, such as humidity, sunlight for example, and wind speed. Therefore, it's not correct and the answer is going to be A. Question number 28. What is the correct route for the movement of water from cell to cell in the apoplast pathway? Now, we have two pathways that water could be transported through. We have the first one which is the apoplast. The apoplast pathway is when water passes between the cell walls of adjacent cells. And then we have the symplast pathway, where water actually goes in by osmosis into the cells through the plasma desmata, then into the vacuum. So in apoplast, water goes around the cell in its cell wall, and in symplast, water goes through the cell by osmosis. Now let's see the suggestions that we have here. A through adjacent cell surface membranes. As we said, it's transported through cell walls, not cell surface membranes, therefore this is incorrect. B, through intercellular spaces. 
Intercellular spaces are also known as cell walls, for example, in between cells, as we just mentioned, therefore this is correct. See, through the plasmodesmata. This is incorrect through the plasmodesmata is the symplast pathway, where water penetrates inside the cell. D, through the Casparian strip. This is incorrect for apoplast pathway. Why you would ask? Because the Casparian strip has a material called suberin. And this is a waterproof material that does not allow water through the cell walls. Therefore, it blocks the apoplastic pathway and only allows the simplast. Therefore, it's going to be correct and the correct answer is going to be B. Question number 29. Which row shows the correct sequence for the movement of sucrose into phloem sieve tubes? Now, let's first outline the process of movement of sucrose into phloem sieve tubes and into companion cells. First, let's assume that this is a companion cell. And this is a phloem sieve tube element. Now what happens is that the companion cells start by pumping hydrogen ions to its cell wall outside the cell by proton pumps. Now this is an active process that requires ATP. Now sucrose molecules are already formed from adjacent mesophyll cells. Then what happens is a sucrose molecule and a hydrogen ions moves back into the companion cell through a transport protein called a co-transporter protein. Now, once the sucrose is already inside the companion cell, it now diffuses from the companion cell into the phloem sieve tube elements down concentration gradient through the plasmodesmata. Now, let's see the suggestions that we have here. A the first step, diffusion of sucrose into the companion cell cytoplasm. This is not correct. As you said, we have to first start with pumping of hydrogens. B, co-transport. This is incorrect. It's not the first step. C, active transport of protons into the companion cell cytoplasm. So these are correct. <laughs> Second, active transport of protons into the companion cell cytoplasm. This is incorrect, incorrect. Here we have diffusion of sucrose into the companion cell cytoplasm. As we said, sucrose does not actually diffuse into the companion cell. It goes into the companion cell through a co-transporter protein, not by just normal diffusion. Therefore, this is incorrect. Now, co-transport of protons and sucrose into the companion cell cytoplasm. Yes, it's correct through a co-transporter protein, as we just mentioned. This is the second. Then the third is going to be the diffusion of sucrose into the sieve tube elements. So this is correct and the answer is going to be D. Number 30, what occurs during ventricular systole in a mammalian heart? Now ventricular systole is where the ventricles contract. And when this happens, the pressure inside the ventricle increases, pushing the semilunar valves open and pushing blood through the aorta or a pulmonary artery. Now let's start with one. Aortic pressure increases, of course. If the ventricular pressure increases and the semilunar valve is pushed open and blood goes into the aorta, then definitely the aortic pressure also increases. Two, atrial pressure does not change. Now this is incorrect. Here we're talking about the atrium. So as we all know, when ventricular systole, the contraction of the ventricle takes place, then the atria is going to relax. Or diastole it's going to be atrial diastole this means that the pressure in the atria actually decreases therefore this is incorrect three ventricular pressure increases we just mentioned that point and the answer is going to be B question number 31 which plant diagram represents the tissues in a major vein now as we all know that veins have a wider lumen and a thinner tunica media now let's see the suggestions that we have here. First of all, let's just start with C. C is totally incorrect because here it's assuming that the veins have only two layers. This is incorrect. Veins actually have tunica intima, tunica media, and tunica externa. Therefore, this is incorrect. Now, coming back to our point, we said that veins have a wide lumen and a thinner tunica media. But in A and B, we could see a very narrow lumen. Therefore, this must be an artery. This can never be a vein. Therefore, A and B are, correct, are incorrect. Now, D, as we can see here, it's somehow a wider lumen than the rest. Therefore, D is going to be the correct answer. And it also has three layers.
Question number 32, the diagram shows the pressure changes in various structures of the left side of the heart during the cardiac cycle, at the end of which period is the ventricle full of blood. So, the ventricle is full of blood when ventricular diastole takes place or the relaxing phase of the ventricle. Now. What happens is because it's relaxing, it's actually filling now with the blood. Now, as you all know that ventricular diastole has a lower ventricular pressure. Therefore, we're looking at here and here. But the ventricle is always full of blood before it contracts. Therefore, A is going to be the correct answer because the diastole happens before the contraction, systole. And this is when the ventricle is actually full of blood. Three, which description of movement of substances during tissue fluid formation is correct? A. Low hydrostatic pressure forces substances out of the capillary. Now, this is incorrect because it's supposed to be the high hydrostatic pressure forces substances out, not the low. Now, B. Tissue fluid moves back into the venule due to a net hydrostatic pressure change in the capillary. Now, this is incorrect. Tissue fluid actually moves back into the venule from a high water potential in the tissue fluid to low water potential. The reason for this is because inside the capillary there is a high concentration of plasma proteins, therefore lowering the water potential inside the capillaries. Therefore this is incorrect. C. Movement of water in tissue fluid into the capillary by osmosis is due to the low water potential and low hydrostatic pressure inside the capillary. Yes, of course, as we all know, the movement of tissue fluid depends on two opposing factors and it's the pressure and the water potential. Now here it says due to a low water potential in the capillary, as we said, due to the plasma proteins and due to low hydrostatic pressure. So the capillaries no longer have a tendency to push substances out. Therefore, there is a net movement now of water into the capillaries at the venous and therefore this is correct and the answer is going to be C. Question number 34, which row shows the change in concentration of some substances in red blood cells when carbon dioxide diffuses from active cells? Now let's start with carbonic anhydrase. Carbonic anhydrase is an enzyme converting carbon dioxide and water to carbonic acid. Therefore, its concentration is actually not altered. Therefore, there is no change. Then hydrogen carbonate ions. Now, as you all know, carbon dioxide combines with water inside the red blood cell by catalyzed by the enzyme carbonic anhydrase forming carbonic acid. This carbonic acid dissociates into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions. Therefore, this means that if the concentration of carbon dioxide increases, also the concentration of hydrogen carbonate and the hydrogen ions both increase, therefore the answer is going to be D. Question number 35, which statements about the human gas exchange system are correct? 1. The absence of cartilage in small bronchioles allow them to expand. This is correct. The absence of cartilage basically give them flexibility. 2. The walls of the alveoli are made of cuboidal epithelium. This is incorrect. It's made of squamous epithelium. Therefore, this is incorrect. 3. Alveoli secrete a substance which reduces surface tension. Now, the substance is called pulmonary surfactant. And what the substance does, we all know that water molecules have a tendency to form hydrogen bonds with each other. Let's assume that this is the alveoli. Therefore, if this actually happens and water molecules form the hydrogen bonds with each other, this means that the alveoli is basically going to collapse. Now, to avoid this, pulmonary surfactant basically separates water molecules away from each other so the alveoli does not collapse and they don't form hydrogen bonds with each other. Therefore, this is correct for the trachea and bronchi are supported by rings of cartilage. Now, this is the error here. It's assuming that both trachea and bronchi have cartilage rings. They both have cartilage, but only trachea has rings of cartilage. But the bronchi has irregular blocks of cartilage. Therefore, this is incorrect and the answer is going to be B. Question number 36, four types of cell in the gas exchange system are listed. The text in the table shows specialized features of 
three of these types of cell, which are correctly matches the specialized feature with the correct cell. Now let's start with the easiest and it's cell number three. As we can see here, it contains many mitochondria, lots of endoplasmic reticulum, and many Golgi bodies. This means that this cell has an active protein secretion or a high rate of protein synthesis. This means that it's most likely going to be a goblet cell because goblet cells secrete high amounts of mucus. Therefore, 3 is going to be goblet cell. And because both cell 1 and 2 are the same, there is no difference, so we cannot really identify them. Therefore, if we know that cell 3 is going to be L, therefore the answer is going to be C. Question number 37. Why is it difficult to control the spread of tuberculosis? 1. Global air travel for commerce and tourism has increased. Of course. If global air travel has increased, therefore the spread between people is more common because as we all know tuberculosis is transferred by airborne droplets between people. So this means if there are more people going around, it's also going to increase. Point number two, the bacterium that causes tuberculosis has evolved resistance to some antibiotics. Now this is a clear cause to why it's difficult to control the spread of tuberculosis because if the bacterium is resistant to the antibiotics this means that it will not be killed quickly and it would stay a longer time into the person's body and the person is going to be infected for longer and if the person is infected for longer he is more likely to spread tuberculosis to other people too therefore this is correct and that causes tuberculosis shows great antigenic variability now mycobacterium tuberculosis does not actually show a great antigenic variability what shows a great antigenic variability are eukaryotic cells such as for example plasmodium therefore this is incorrect for civil unrest and poverty result in overcrowded living conditions as we said tuberculosis is transferred by airborne droplets and if more people live together in overcrowded conditions it's more likely to spread therefore the correct answer is going to be a question number 38 rabies is a viral disease which can be spread by humans via bite from an infected animal one method of treatment is to inject the patient with antibodies specific to the rabies virus which statement about this treatment is correct now Injected with antibodies means that it is artificial, passive, immunity. Therefore, the immune response is not going to be generated and no memory cells are going to be formed, which is a short-term protection. Now, let's see the suggestions that we have here. One, the patient will have natural passive immunity. No, it's not natural, it's artificial, so this is incorrect too. Inject the antibodies will be broken down by the patient. Yes, eventually, oral antibodies injected are going to be broken down by the patient's body. That's why it's a short-term effect and it's going to three. The patient's memory cells will be able to produce this antibody more rapidly in the future. No, this is incorrect because this means that a primary immune response took place and memory cells have been formed. So this is incorrect for the immunity provided will only last a short time. Yes, this is correct. It's only temporary. Therefore, the correct answer is going to be D. Question number 39. A person's blood group is determined by antigens present on red blood cells. The table shows the antigens and antibodies in blood of people with different blood groups. During a blood transfusion, it is essential that the person who receives the blood does not have antibodies to the donor's blood. Which blood groups can be given to a person with blood group B? Now, blood group B has antibodies to A. Therefore, if a person needs a blood transfusion with a blood group B, it cannot have anything to do with A. Therefore, A is going to be incorrect and also AB is going to be correct because it here says the person who receives the blood does not have antibodies to the donor's blood. Therefore, the correct answer must be then B and O, which is going to be D. Question number 40. A student used the diagram to show four types of cells involved in the primary immune response, which row is correct. So cell type 1, let's start with it, release chemicals that stimulate phagocytes to engulf antigens. So in this case, it's going to be the T helper cell, which releases cytokines such as interleukins, and these stimulates the phagocytes. 
Now, cell number two destroys cells infected with viruses, which would be released into the body. So what destroys cells is going to be T killer cells. Why you would ask? Because T killer cells secretes perforin, a material called perforin, and this causes the cell to burst. Therefore, T killer cell is correct. For cell number three, produce the antibodies required to bind to the antigen. Now, what produces the antibodies we all know? It's going to be the B cell. When it's stimulated by an antigen, it divides into both plasma cells and memory cells. Therefore, B lymphocyte is correct. And cell number four, recognize the foreign antigen, move towards it and surrounds it. Now, this is correct. This is phagocytosis and occurs by macrophages. Therefore, the answer is going to be C. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you think this channel offers you any value, I'd highly appreciate it if you would subscribe and like this video. Thank you very much.